Hello, my name is David Lewis. Um, I'm coming to you from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I'm here today to talk about uh, a project mapping the digital scholarly communications infrastructure. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of um, my two colleagues, Mike Roy, uh, the Dean of Libraries at Middlebury College and Catherine Skinner, um, the Executive Director at Educopia. Um, and this was the team that has been working on this project for the last couple of years. A little bit of background on where this project came from and how we got to where we are. Um, it, it began with um, my little paper, um, the two and a half percent commitment, and I circulated that to a number of my friends and colleagues, and Mike Roy and I began a conversation, and we decided that what we uh, would be useful to do would to do a map of what the open scholarly infrastructure looked like. Um, and we had an ambition of trying to create a map of that infrastructure that looks something like this map of uh, the commercial infrastructure that Posada and Chen had put together. Um, we, were, we were jealous of this accomplishment and we wanted to try to do something akin to this um, with OPEN. Um, we did a number of presentations and um, that led um, at, at a couple of years ago to a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to um, uh, do a study of the digital scholarly infrastructure. This was not quite what we had in mind. Um, we wanted to look both at infrastructure and content in an open environment, um, but the funding we got from Mellon, um, we just looked at open, uh, just looked at infrastructure, and we looked at both the open infrastructure and the proprietary infrastructure, um, both of which were provided on occasion by both commercial firms um, and not-for-profits. So this is the, the team that uh, we put together. Um, shortly after we got the grant, we uh, brought in Catherine Skinner um, as a, a core member of the team. Uh, we put together a, a really nice and, and very talented um, advisory committee that um, we consulted with in a variety of points along with the project. And the survey and visual, visualization work that um, I'll talk about a little bit later um, was largely done by Nathan Brown um, and his firm, uh, True Bearing. So in the beginning, it's important to talk about what we mean by infrastructure. Um, and this is a, a little bit tricky in, in some ways, um, but the way we thought about it in general was it was the tools, services, and systems that underpin uh, scholarly communications. There, there are a couple of dimensions of this that, that become a little bit tricky. There is a, a, a gray area between content that lives on a particular system and the system itself. And in many cases, it's really hard to disentangle that. So things like Hadi Trust or Archive, um, we tended to include some of those when they were very large and general. We also didn't look at discipline-specific discipline infrastructure, um, but rather it, the, the things we included needed to have some general application across disciplines. Um, and we looked at communications, what that meant, and we, we defined that very broadly from um, discovery to access to preservation, um, but it was not the things and tools that were used to create scholarship. So it's the communication of scholarship broadly defined, not the creation of scholarship. So we, and, and also there's some gray area there as well, um, tools used to write and bring data into articles. We tended to include those, um, but if it was, a data manipulation tool or a digital humanities tool, we left those out. We tried to create a, a, a higher a, a description of the different types of, of tools. Um, and this is uh, the one that we mostly worked with, but this kind of categorization really needs some work. And, and it's one of the things we'll recommend at the end. But um, we, we started with researcher tools. There's some writing tools, collaboration tools. Uh, repositories, preprint servers leading into a variety of publishing tools, both for monographs and journals, um, the, the whole discovery piece, um, evaluation and assessments of various sorts, preservation. And then there are a series of what we've called general services that overlay the whole system. So things like um, ORCID or um, DOAJ, things of that sort um, that make it all possible um, are, are also included. 
So the project had six goals, but the first of which was to create a census of the infrastructure providers. We, we thought it was very important to try to understand um, who was out there, what they were doing, and how they all fit together in the, to the best of our ability. So we tried to do a survey of that. We called that the census of, um, so that was the first piece. The second piece had to do, uh, was a literature review. We looked um, very um, diligently and across the web and, and harvested a lot of literature about a variety of general issues and also about specific projects. In order to, and both of those look at the, the provider side. We also did a, a number of case studies of the providers to um, do some qualitative data that would enrich the numeric uh, and, and quantitative stuff that we pulled out of the census. The other side that we wanted to look at was how uh, particularly libraries invested in these providers to get a sense of, of who was making what kinds of investments and why. And we did this in a couple of ways. We looked at um, focus groups. We did a number of focus groups um, with library leaders. And we also did a survey of library investments in an attempt to capture the amount of money that was being invested by libraries of a number of sizes and types um, and, and, uh, and, and what things they were putting their money into in terms of supporting the infrastructure that um, they rely on. And then as I said at the beginning, our ambition was to create this map of the digital scholarly infrastructure. Um, and ironically, um, we accomplished, um, at least to some degree, all the first five things, but um, the map, uh, we, we have a, a draft that's very preliminary, but uh, that was the one piece that we didn't accomplish in the way that we had really hoped for. This is another way of looking at the things we tried to accomplish. You can look at the, the library side of it, and you can look at the infrastructure provider side of it, um, and, and qualitative and quantitative views. So the focus groups, the literature review, the case studies uh, were, were qualitative. The survey and the census um, were web-based surveys um, that attempted to collect um, mostly quantitative data. So I'm going to run through the five pieces that we've uh, really uh, managed to accomplish. The first of those was the census of providers. This was a, a web-based survey. Um, it was done. Um, largely by um, True Bearing and, and Catherine uh, Skinner wrote it up. It was based on um, a tool that uh, Jacopia had put together um, that um, looked at the organizational maturity and financial maturity of, um, in, of organizations. And um, this is a, a fairly extensive document. If you're really interested, I would encourage you to, to take a look at it. Um, Catherine also wrote a, a a blog post um, called uh, "Running a Queen Red Queen's Race," um, which which is her interpretation of the data, and I would I would recommend that piece to you as well. In general, uh, the findings of the census. The first one I think is is pretty stark. We only got uh, forty two responses to the census after um, haranguing and harassing uh, a number of providers for some time. Um, so we were, we were disappointed with that result, um, and, and we think it's pretty important, but uh, to try to continue this effort, and I'll talk about that a little bit farther down, it's pretty clear that um, we need the taxonomy that I talked at, about a little bit at the beginning in order to get a better sense of how to think about and look at what's out there. The other thing that became very clear to us is that many of the providers um, were challenged to provide the, the data that we requested. And a lot of what we were looking for uh, was financial data. And um, particularly open providers, um, often they are project embedded in different organizations and or are grant funded or multi-organizational uh, uh, projects. And it's not easy often for them to bring together the information that we uh, we're requesting uh, quickly enough to, to make filling out our census uh, instrument worth their while. A lot of people got frustrated with that. Um, and so I think that it's, uh, that effort needs to continue. And it's a sign that 
many of the providers are, are the, their institution, their organizations are not as um, mature or as robust as they ought to be. Um, the data we were requesting really should be straightforward if you had a good annual report, and a lot of people really didn't have that easy, easily at hand. And many were, especially small projects, um, just the, the time to even do a very relatively short survey was, was a challenge. Um, among the open providers uh, who did manage to, to do this survey, and, and actually many of those who did found it a really valuable exercise because it required them to pull data together that they hadn't before. But as, as you would, uh, I think, expect, many of them have a hard time um, raising and sustaining the level of funding that, that's needed to really maintain uh, the projects. Um, it also became clear that many of the providers are in need of gu guidance, mentorship, training, other kinds of opportunities in order to enhance their organizational and financial health. So again, we have a lot of organizations that are pro providing important infrastructure that are not as robust as we would hope for. The other thing that's quite clear in looking at this is that um, there is no uh, coordinated or even uncoordinated end-to-end -end workflow in the op open environment and that the varieties of technologies um, and strategies that the providers are using um, will make it a real challenge to put all of this together. And this is true at, at a time when uh, the commercial providers, um, particularly the large publishing houses, are, are working very diligently and with significant resources to try to put this end-to-end -end workflow in place. And so um, if you believe, as we do, that, that open is important, this is a, a very dangerous sign for us. We really need to work on uh, trying to figure out how to make this happen. So the, the second piece um, was the literature review, um, and I did this work, um, and I've called it a bibliographic scan of the digital scholarly communication infrastructure. It is an extensive bibliographic um, essay and, uh, that looks at um, both the literature of the, the deal with the general issues involved in this and then the literature that uh, documents the activities of, a, 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 of the sector. Um, I identified just over 200 projects. Um, the, about two thirds of them were, um, were not for profit. Many of these were very small projects. Um, and then I, I also identified uh, 67 commercial uh, projects uh, in, in a variety of firms. Uh, it's uh, it, insightful, I think, to just it's, it's, uh, that many of, there, there are relatively small number of organizations that provide a significant number of the projects, both on the commercial and on the um, not-for-profit side. So if you look at uh, organizations like DSpace, um, Public Knowledge Project, they, they have a variety of projects involved and on the commercial side, the big firms do as well. So this is as close as we get to a, a map. This shows the the sort of the workflow is the yellow arrow in the middle running from sort of creation just off the screen all the way through to preservation and assessment. You can see the, the number of different projects in each of those areas. Um, I think it's interesting if you look at the researcher tools, um, the ones that are really significant, particularly around collaboration, um, are very, are controlled by large commercial firms. Um, Discovery layer um, is also the, the important tools are, are managed by large commercial firms, but in this case, the firms are not part of the scholarly communications environment. Really, they're Google Scholar and, and Microsoft, and, and the ones that really matter are from big firms that are sort of outside our sector. Um, in the repository sector and in the publishing sector, there are a large number of um, not-for-profit open uh, alternatives. One might say that there are really maybe in some cases too many um, and that the, there are redundancies in there that, that are unnecessary and that we maybe need to look at sunsetting some of those projects or weeding them out. Uh, although the, how that happens is a really difficult way to think about it. Um, there are a, a variety of preservation uh, strategies, many of them open, although Probably the most important is, is a commercial firm. 
And then when we get to assessment, um, again, the large commercial firms um, dominate, particularly in the CRISP systems. Um, and so at both ends of the research workflow, the are dominated by commercial firms. In the middle, there are many good open uh, alternatives, but those are not coordinated in a way that would you would be able to piece together a, a, a consistent workflow easily. So the next piece has to do with case studies. These were done by Catherine Skinner. Um, you can see the, the four firms that she looked at. Um, again, we have a, a fairly nice publication that brings these all together. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at them if you if you have interest in any of these projects. Um, there also are a series of case studies that have just been released by Spark Europe, and, and I would encourage you to look at those as well, um, as well as some conversations that ha are similar in nature that the Invest in Open Infrastructure Group has recently released. So there are a variety of case studies beyond what we did um, that, that can give you a feel for the particularly the open side of the infrastructure. Uh, system. The next piece I want to talk about um, are the library focus groups. Um, we did a series of, of groups. We did some at ALA in uh, the summer of 19 and at with ARL in, in September at CNI uh, last, uh, November, last December, and we did a series of, of virtual sessions in January and February of this year. Um, the majority were from large research universities, I think mostly because we were at ARL, um, and then a smattering of other kinds of uh, libraries. We asked them how much do they invest, where they invest, and why they invest, um, as well as what the challenges and opportunities they were, were from where they sit. I think the most striking finding that, that we had here in the focus groups was that um, often people really have a hard time sorting out how much money they, they invest in the infrastructure, particularly the open infrastructure. And these were primarily library directors. So unlike collections where the definition of what ought to be counted where are pretty clear, and, and you could ask most library directors how much they spend on collections or staffing, and they would be able to give you a number off the top of their head um, almost uh, immediately. And this was not the case with open. They really didn't know how to, uh, they, they really hadn't done that exercise before. And so they, they often didn't, didn't have a number at the tip of their tongue, um, and which I think is, is really important. And a, it's an effort that I think would be important for library organizations that think about statistics to start to define these things so that um, we really have a better picture of, of how much investment is going in which directions. When we asked them about some why they invested, um, a lot of the answers were what you would expect. They wanted to be part of a community, particularly if it was a tool they were using that they wanted to influence. Sometimes the investment that got them a seat at the governance table, table was useful. Um, interestingly, a lot of people said that it's the keep up with the Joneses, or I trust my friends um, at a, a, com a compat comparable institution, and she invests, so I'm prepared to do it because I trust her judgment. Not so much that I've done the assessment, but that it's what everybody else is doing. And a lot of people admitted that they really didn't have a good sense of whether the, what the trade-offs were and, and whether or not they were making good, uh, good investments. When we asked about the factors, we, we got the kinds of analysis when they were carefully looking, in some cases, that you would expect about privacy costs, exit strategies, that kind of thing. Um, there was a, a major concern about the sustainability of the system. And as I've talked about when we talked about the, the census, um, that's really justifiable. I mean, the, the, the sustainability of the whole system is, is at risk, I think, and not as robust as we would hope. Um, and there was a frustration with the, the funding model, which was you know, an, uh, an organization that uh, a tool we use comes to us and says, give us five to $20,000. And there's no overall strategy and there's no clear way of creating an overall strategy for investments that would invest in the whole system. And there was a sense that, it, and, and often this was based on a, a campus um, rather than a library perspective, that you really needed to invest in strategies that were, were quote unquote winners or that had a sustainable um, strategy. And, and often those were 
commercial players. So B press might be a better investment, even though you hate the idea of doing it because um, your computer center says you need something you can trust for the long haul. technical glitch here. Um, so when we looked at the library, um, so, oh, excuse me here. So we, the next piece is the, the library survey. Um, sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, the library survey, again, was a web-based tool. Um, we asked about investments, uh, numeric investments in particular tools, which we had classified, and then some other data on staffing. Um, we got 91 responses. Uh, two thirds were large uh, research universities, mostly it, about a quarter were small liberal arts colleges and then a smattering of the other types. Um, a couple of, this was obviously a very low response rate considering the number of institutions. Uh, and primarily we were focus, focusing on the US. Um, it, it occurs, to, it appears to us that there was a bias towards people who were um, invested in open um, and often the, the data was incomplete. And, and again, I think this is the issue that often uh, the people responding to the survey had a hard time pulling the data together. So here is uh, some of the, the data that we were, uh, got, got here. You can see that uh, there was um, $14 million of investment by these 91 libraries. That's about 150,000 apiece, one and a half percent of the library budget um, and uh, two and a half percent if you take off of salaries and that was $8 a student. Um, we based our survey, I should say, um, in large part uh, on a survey that the Canadian uh, Association of Research Libraries have done, and I would strongly recommend their survey if you're really interested. Look at their survey if you're looking, uh, if you're interested in that data. Um, here's another couple of ways of looking at it. A large portion of the return, 10 million, over 10 million of the 14 million was in staffing. So less than four million dollars actually left the campus uh, so that's a relatively small investment in infrastructure providers the majority of that was for hosted uh, repository solutions um, and then you can can see that down the the way um, this is another interesting way of looking at it you can see the graphs here the the pers the, the higher up you are um, the the more as a um, larger percentage of the investments you're making uh, as a library. You can see the one really high large library um, and that's a, a, a university that supports a very large project so they make a, a significant investment in it. Um, the majority of the respondents regardless of size invested less than two percent um, and there's a great deal of free riding. Often we asked about which projects they used, and often people would use a project but not make an investment in it. So that's the, the, the work that we did. I think it's probably important to, to uh, indicate that we did all of this before the pandemic, pandemic set in, so our data is all based on that and it may be subject to change as, change as a result of that. Um, we have a, a series of recommendations that we made and the, th the first three are the most important. We think that um, continued efforts to try to get a survey of the open, particularly open providers, uh, so that we can get a picture of what that uh, universe looks like and can begin to think about it as a coherent whole rather than bits and pieces. Uh, it's also clear that a variety of strategies that um, work to enhance the organizational and uh, financial robustness of that community of providers is important, whether it's a community of practice or other kinds of work, um, we think that's pretty important. And we think that the library surve survey ought to be continued in some way, whether that's groups like ARL or other library organizations that might try to collect that data. It would be useful if all libraries did it, but if we could get um, even 
uh, some large uh, consortiums or groups to work on it, they could get some of the kinks out of it. The other things, uh, a sort of annual report of the survey of the, the sector would probably be useful. Case studies continue to be useful. Some idea about working with librarians to, to get a, give them a better sense of what go, is going on would probably be important as well. So we, we have a variety of reports and resources. I, I, Catherine Skinner's done a couple of these. I did the, the bibliographic scan. Um, we have a couple of blog posts I would recommend, as, as I've said before, the second one here, Catherine's Red's Queen is pretty good. Um, a couple of other uh, resources that are part uh, that you might want to look at. And I put a PDF of this presentation up at this tiny URL so you can uh, then use the links to get to this. So if you have any questions about our project, um, any of us would be happy to hear from you by email. Um, so thank you. Uh, sorry for the little glitches going back and forth, couldn't quite get my screen to work. Um, but again, thank you very much. <laughs>